So, welcome back. So, far in this course we have been studying the various aspects of PLSI physical design. Like you recall we started with the basic PLS, uh, PLSI physical design flow. We looked at the, the essential processes involved like the partitioning, floor planning, placement, routing and so on. Then we talked about the timing issues, we said that the timing issues in high performance circuits are very important. So, we looked at the various kinds of timing analysis, timing aware placement, timing aware routing and so on. So, in this week and also in the coming week, we shall be looking at another aspects of the design when the chips are fabricated. You see, when you are designing the chip, you are taking all the basic things into consideration like of course, the performance, the timing and also the area and the other requirements. Okay. But during fabrication, there can be some faults because of the fabrication, because of the design also, the source of the fault can be several. So, before you can send or ship a product you have fabricated to the market, you need to thoroughly test the product. Okay. So, testing of a fabricated device or a board whatever you say is very important in the context of the overall design flow of a VLSI system. Okay. So, the topic of our lecture today is testing of VLSI circuits. So, let us first try to motivate ourselves why do we need testing. So, as I have just said that the fabrication processes are becoming more and more complex with the advent of the deep submicron design technologies. So, now the features which are there in a design they are coming closer and closer together, they are becoming smaller and thinner. So, the chances of two wires let us say touching each other or a very thin wire breaking in between are becoming also pretty significant. Okay. These are the so called sources of errors or faults. So, there can be such errors that can creep in during the design and fabrication processes. Not only that, you see we are typically using some CAD tools from some of the vendors. right? Now, this CAD tools themselves are very complex software programs. There is always the chance of some bugs existing in those programs. So, when you are translating a design specification finally, into your layout level specification, there can be some bugs which can creep in during this translation. And also when you are means after fabricating when you are doing the packaging, there also there can be some faults because of uh, incorrect or imperfect connections and so on. So, the bottom line is we need to test each and every chip before they can be shipped. So, this is what I have said already. Okay. So, what is the basic objective of testing? Well, the truth is we use testing to determine the presence of faults. It can be a chip, it can be a circuit which consists of several chips. So, when I have a such a system which is a single chip or a collection of chips, we want to determine the presence of faults, but there is a fallacy. Well, sometimes we tend to think that we are using testing to guarantee that a circuit or a chip is free from any faults, but this is a false statement, this is not true. Why? Because you see, uh, I mean you are doing testing, how do you are testing? Given a circuit, you typically you apply some inputs, you observe some outputs and also there are some electrical characteristics like the delay switching and other characteristics also you test. Now, the now issue is there are so many environmental variations possible like temperature, humidity, pressure, vibration and so on. So, who will guarantee that well I am carrying out testing in an environment where my ambient temperature is 32 degree Celsius, but if my temperature rises to 35 degrees my circuits might fail because some transistors might not be working properly may not be switching as per the specification. So, it is not 
really possible to test against all possible environmental variations and uh, possibilities. This is why we say, so however elaborately we carry out testing, we can never guarantee that the product we are manufacturing is free of any faults. Okay. So, what we are trying to achieve? We can only increase our confidence in the correct working of the circuit. And there is an auxiliary process which is also involved called verification. We usually used verification along with testing to, to improve our confidence in the correct working of the circuits and devices. But verification and testing have very different objectives. Let us try to see what these are. So, here we show the differences between verification flow and the testing flow. Verification basically tries to guarantee the correctness of the design. Design means we have not yet fabricated the circuit. So, our design is available either in the form of a high level description like in Verilog or VHDL or it is available in the form of some kind of a net list register transfer level or gate level net list. So, we want to verify whether the design that is available at that level conforms to our desired specification. And this is performed only once, because we are performing the, we are actually evaluating the design not the fabricated chips. So, it is performed once before the actual manufacturing starts. And because we are assessing the correctness of the design, this process assures quality of the design. Okay. And Typically, methods like formal theorem proving techniques, various formal methods, SAD based techniques, many are available, and also simulation based techniques are used to carry out verification. Now, in contrast, the process of testing uh, it tries to guarantee the correctness of the manufactured chips or circuits. Now, you see, I have made a difference in the two step. Here I mentioned verification guarantees and here I said testing tries to guarantee, because as I have just now said using testing you can never guarantee 100 percent free from faults or failures, but verification is a formal process. It is some kind of a proof that you are giving mathematically whether your design is correct or not. Okay. Testing naturally as I had mentioned has to be performed on each and every device that you are manufacturing, because each and every device can be faulty. And by doing testing you are improving the quality of the devices that you are sending to the market. During testing two steps are involved, one is done a single time this is called test generation. Test generation means given a circuit I want to find out what are the inputs I need to apply to the circuit, so that I can test it in the way I want okay. that is called test generation. Now, for a given circuit test generation is done only once, but for each and every chip you have to actually apply those test vectors this is called test application. Test application is done once for every device. So, now we look into the uh, issue that, uh, that exactly when do we do testing? Do we do testing when the chips are fabricated or do we do testing when we have already put the chips on a board, the boards in a system and the overall system is ready, we want to test at that level. So, there are implications. So, we can actually do or carry out testing at various levels like for instance we can do it at the chip level while the chips are getting manufactured. So, you can also do testing at the next higher level namely the board level where several of these chips have been integrated on a printed circuit board and thirdly at, a, at, a, at an even higher level when you are building a system there will be several such boards in the system. 
So, when all these boards are assembled together to form the system, we can even carry out testing at that level. Now, there is an empirical rule of thumb which exists. This is sometimes also called the rule of 10. This roughly says that if you are able to detect a fault early, it will reduce the overall cost of testing. And this empirical rule says that it is 10 times more expensive to test a device as we move to the next higher level. For example, chip level to board level, board level to system level. Like for example, when you have manufactured a chip, if you give me that well, I want to test this chip, well I can tell you that you apply these inputs to the chip and see whether these outputs are coming. So, I can tell you some procedure for testing the chip. But suppose you have a board where there are 10 such chips already soldered and you suddenly ask me that this board is not working. So, how do I found out what the fault is? Now, this fault can be in any one of these 10 chips, right? So, it is much more difficult to identify and diagnose the fault, where the fault is located and what is the fault like, right? So, if you talk about the even higher level, several such boards, the problem of testing and fault diagnosis is even more. So, sometimes what happens many of the manufacturers when they find some fault in a board, they simply replace the board by a new board instead of trying to find out where the fault is, right? because the cost involved is pretty high there, cost in terms of time and effort. So, talking about the sources of faults, so we said that the faults can be because of errors during fabrication process. Like uh, we, we actually fabricate some rectangular patterns on the surface of the silicon. So, some of such rectangular patterns may be missing, this is called missing contact window. Accidentally, some diffusion and polysilicon layers might overlap, leading to parasitic transistors and so on. There can be some defects in the materials on which the chips or the layers are getting fabricated like the substrate, silicon substrate. There can be some cracks or imperfection or some dust particles on the surface, which may lead to some imperfections in the layers which are fabricated on top of it. Now, now you may recall that uh, the geometry of the features that you are fabricating that is very much comparable with the size of the smallest speck of dust. Okay. So, so, having a dustless environment during fabrication is extremely important. Okay. So, there can be some errors uh, which may, may appear because of prolonged usage which is called aging. Some dielectrics might break down, there is a process called electron migration and so on. And lastly, there can be defects when you are putting a small chip inside a plastic package and connecting the pins of the chip to the pins of the package. So, there can be some imperfections in the contacts, the wires you are using to connect them. So, there can be so many sources of faults. Okay. Broadly speaking, this diagram shows how we can categorize the basic types of faults. Like like in the highest level, the faults can be categorized as permanent or non-permanent and the non-permanent non faults on the other hand can be categorized as transient or intermittent. So, let us see what these are, what are their characteristics. The permanent faults as the name implies, they are permanent means they change the behavior of a circuit or a chip in a way which is not dependent on time, it is permanent. This can happen due to design errors, maybe your fabrication is perfect, but your design was wrong because of some incorrect connections and so on. These kind of faults are much easier to detect because when you are carrying out the testing, it is guaranteed that this kind of faults will be present because it is permanent. But in contrast, non permanent faults do not appear at all times they occur randomly, they show up at unpredictable times and when they show up, they will remain present 
for unpredictable durations. So, you see there is no there is no guarantee that when you are actually testing a chip this kind of non permanent faults will show up may be right after the testing is over you declare the chip is good some of these faults show up. Okay. So, these faults are relatively much more difficult to detect and for this kind of faults there is a methodology called online testing which is quite popular. Now, what is online testing very broadly speaking here we are using some kind of codes meaning just by looking at the output of a circuit I can say that whether this circuit is a valid output or an invalid output. Like a simple example I can say that the number of ones in the output will always be odd this is how I design my circuit. So, if during operation I find that some of the output is coming with odd not odd even number of ones then I can declare immediately that there is a fault somewhere. So, this checking I am doing using hardware continuously during normal circuit operation that is why this is called online testing right. Now, under the non permanent faults transient faults occur due to some environmental conditions which sometimes happen sometimes they do not happen. Like you may be working in an environment where there are lot of charged particles there can be variations in pressure vibration temperature. Like one classic example is this happens whenever we use some computer systems let us say in an aircraft or in a satellite or in an some kind of a space mission and so on. So, you know that in today's computer systems we use the memory systems memory units using something called dynamic ram dynamic memory. So, in a dynamic memory we store the information not as a flip flop as in a classical static storage device, but as the charge stored on a tiny capacitor. Now, if such a chip is exposed to external charged particle radiations like alpha particles let us say. So, these particles can penetrate the surface of the chip, they can go inside the chip, they can hit the capacitors and the charge might get discharged. So, some bit which was stored as 1 might become 0. Okay. These are sometimes called soft errors because these are not because of any hardware damages or faults but because of a temporary situation let us say some alpha radiation or of alpha particles are hitting, but after some time these will go out and again this circuit will start working correctly right. In contrast intermittent faults they are caused due to non environmental conditions like loose connections the timing is very critical sometimes it is meeting and sometimes it is not meeting changes in parameter values of transistors resistances over time. So, this kind of faults are very difficult to detect this may require repeated testing for detection. Okay. So, the, the kind of faults that we talk about in our subsequent uh, discussions we will be assuming that there are permanent in nature for handling the non permanent faults as I said some kind of online fault testing is done which is a little beyond the scope of our discussion in this course. Okay. So, there is another issue we talk about fault enumeration like can we count the number of possible physical defects we cannot because they are too huge I can say that the value of a resistance is changing the resistance is supposed to be 100 ohm it has changed, but that is not a single fault I can say the 100 ohm has become 100.1 ohm 100 ohm has become 100.11 ohm. 100.111 ohm. So, there are infinite such variations which are possible in terms of the faults we really cannot count or enumerate the total number of such faults which has happened right these are physical defects. So, now the question arises. So, um, if we accept the fact that number of defects can be infinitely large. So, how do we judge that the testing we carry out is good or bad. Okay because anyway we cannot address all possible defects right. 
So, what we normally do is we, we abstract this physical defects in some way and define something called logical fault model, which is some kind of an abstraction, which is much simpler to understand and analyze. Means, simpler to analyze means here you can count how many faults are possible in terms of this fault model. Then you can tell that well I have a test, in that test 90 percent of these faults are getting detected. This is possible here. Okay. You can judge the quality of a set of test vectors. You can actually count that for a given set of test vectors. So, how many of these faults are getting tested. Okay. Now, some terminologies are defined here. The first is something called fault coverage. This determines the quality of a set of test vectors. This is defined as the percentage or the fraction of the total number of logical faults that can be tested using a given test set. That means, given set of test vectors. So, it is defined as the ratio number of detected faults divide by the total number of faults. So, if you want to express it as a percentage multiply this by 100. Defect level is another term which is also used sometimes. This says fraction of the shipped parts that are defective. That means, we are manufacturing the chips, we are testing them, then we are sending them to the market. Now, what fraction of those chips can be detective, defective? Okay. Now, there is a factor called yield. So, it also depends on the yield. Well, the yield actually tells you that what is the fraction of the chips that are fabricated which are good. So, out of them 1 minus f c will be those fraction of the chips which faults are not being covered. Okay. So, this is a factor which tells you that what is the proportion of the chip which you cannot detect a fault, but you have declared it as good. So, if f c is 1, which means all the faults have been detected, you see d l will be 1, defect level fraction of ship parts that are defective uh, will be uh, means 1 minus 1, 0. Right? So, if f c equal to 1, this will be y to the power 0, 1. Okay. So, this is sometimes used to measure this fraction of ship parts that are defective. Now, another thing testing is not an easy problem. Let us try to justify this ourselves first, that why testing is difficult. We first look at a very naive approach. We take a combination circuit, there are n inputs. So, in the simplest way, we can test the circuits by verifying the truth table. Verifying the truth table means, we can apply all 2 to the power n inputs and check whether the output is coming to be correct or not. But the problem is, you see as n increases 25, 50, 100, well in practical circuits n is much higher, I have shown only up to 100. And here the value of 2 to the power n is shown. You can see for 25 it is about 33 million, it goes to means 1 into 10 to the power 30 for n equal to 100. So, clearly this is not feasible for larger values of n. Okay. As n increases, we cannot use this kind of naive approach of verifying the truth table. So, if we now consider a synchronous sequential circuit, the problem is even more difficult. There are n number of inputs, there are s number of state variables or flip flops. Now, in a sequential circuit when you apply an input, we cannot predict what the output will be, because the output will be dependent on the state of the flip flops. So, if there are s number of flip flops, they can be in 2 to the power s possible states. So, for each of those 2 to the power s possible states, the output can be different. right? So, you must be sure which state the flip flops are, then only you can apply the input. And in a normal sequential circuit, it is not so easy always to initialize the flip flops to a known state. right? So, 2 to the power n possible inputs coupled with 2 to the power s possible states, this results in a complexity of 2 to the power n plus s. You compare this with a combination circuit where this second part was not there, 
here only 2 to the power n was there right. So, verifying the state table for sequential circuit is again infeasible because it is extremely large. So, we need some mechanism to control and observe the states of this internal flip flops. These are called controllability and observability of the state variables. There are some techniques called design for testability, which is used primarily to address this concern. So, how to make this internal state variables or flip flops I mean easily controllable or easily observable. Now, let us quickly look at what are the different processes of testing some of these we shall be discussing in our subsequent lectures. First of course, we already mentioned fault modeling, because the number of physical defects can be infinitely large. Here we abstract the physical defects and define some logical fault model. By doing this we can simplify or limit the scope of test generation, because now we can say that we want to test only faults that belong to this fault model. Okay, we, have, we, have, we have restricted ourselves. So, next step will be to actually generate the tests given a circuit and a set of faults f may be under a logical fault model. Here we are trying to determine a set of test vectors that can detect all the faults in this fault set f. Sometimes we may want to check that given a set of vectors how many faults are getting detected. So, there is another process called fault simulation which is used there. Here the set of faults is given, set of test vectors is given, we determine the faults that are tested by the vectors that are given. So, we can also identify that these are the faults which are still not tested right this is done through fault simulation. Designed for testability I just now mentioned, basically these consist of a set of design rules, which the designer must follow in a religious way. And what is the end result? If they are followed, we will be getting a circuit that will be easier to test, but nothing comes free. In order to do or achieve this, we will have to introduce some extra uh, some extra hardware that means, extra area over it and also some of this hardware will be falling in the critical path which will be slowing down the clock which means, a little bit of performance degradation as well. Now, in the extreme case we can go for something called built in self test. See in the ideal scenario it will be it will be really fantastic to have a chip which can test itself and can tell us that well I am good or I am bad. So, I do not have to do any testing from outside. Okay. This principle or philosophy is called built in self test. So, some kind of test generation and response evaluation are carried out on chip. Now, quite naturally this, this test generation and response evaluation should be such that they can be implemented with very nominal hardware overheads. Okay. If I say that I need a big memory to store my test patterns inside the chip that can be too much of an overhead. So, if we can do this then the chip can test itself. Well, here of course, this test generator and response evaluator must be there inside the chip and the additional control circuits. So, this will also incur some area overheads. So, this diagram gives you the overall testing principle like given a circuit which you want to test we have to apply some inputs the outputs are coming and we have to compare these outputs against some golden response. And after this comparison experiment is over we can declare that the whether the circuit is probably good or it is definitely bad good we cannot say with 100 percent confidence right. Now, this process the different steps that are involved is shown in the diagram. This can be done inside the chip like in built in self test, the pattern application and this comparison can be done outside the chip. So, there are several levels in which you can do the whole thing, but this diagram gives you the overall picture. Okay. So, with this we 
come to the end of this lecture. In the next lecture, we shall be looking into some aspects of fault modeling, because that is the first step before we can proceed towards the other aspects of testing. Thank you.